Nagaland Civil Service Association Ganlaga 46 NCSC General Conference to Aji October 20 Dilusha. Conference to Nyatur Resort Chumukidima Ditagishi, our program the analyst speaker Sharinga in Lokomerbra, special guest Chris Krisha. Program the Kotakuria Homoi Sharinga in Bra, NCSC Laga, illustrious members Chun British Laga Chandakarne, outstanding service Tishi, Itukanki Honor Krisha, our Salam Tishi. Sharanga in Brajanai Shigi, NCS2, Naglan Institute Napagi, history the deeply rooted to say, Aro, 1959, the form constitutes Krapichidi, NCS Katerdu, 274 member, the Takara Hoignase. IV detail program, Saisawa. anticipated 46th General Conference. We are fortunate to have a lineup of distinguished speakers, short films, music, and felicitations. We are privileged to be the host of this morning's program. I am Alun Yim Isaac Solo, EAC, and my co-host is Sri R. Daniel Angami, SDO Civil. As mentioned, by my co-host. This is the inaugural program. We have a long day ahead with the interactive session at 1 p.m., the business session at 2.30 p.m., and the second edition NCAC singing competition at 5 p.m. So at this time, I invite Sri Visashir Kevichasa, pastor, Kingdom Culture Church, to invoke God's blessings for the day's program. Before I pray, I want to read two Bible verses, both from Matthew chapter 6. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Loving, merciful Father, first of all, we acknowledge your gracious presence in this place and we begin by honoring you first. I thank you for this NCSA General Conference and for each one that has come to be a part of this. This is a gathering of people who serve the state and its people in various roles and in different capacities. And I pray that this will be a day that is meaningful, purposeful, and yet also fun. I ask this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, King Jesus. Amen. Each one of you for being a part of this crucial event. Nagaland, with its diverse ethnic communities and distinct geographical challenges, demands a bureaucratic structure that is not only robust and efficient, but also deeply attuned to the intricacies of local dynamics. These challenges with unwavering dedication, integrity, and a proactive approach, or duty, it transcends administrative roles. It involves actively contributing to the holistic development of our society, ensuring that every policy 
and decisions taken reflects the aspirations and welfare of the people we serve. As NCS officers, our responsibilities are multifaceted, and it is imperative that we remain steadfast in upholding the principles of good governance, transparency, and accountability in all our endeavors. Nagaland Civil Service, as we all know, is the premier civil service of the state. It is a vital institution because it is responsible for implementing the laws and executing policies and programs of the state government and it acts as, a, as an agent of social change and economic development. I was really impressed to see the heartwarming and inspiring stories that have been so beautifully documented. I think uh, it really should inspire each and every one of the members of the association and even other members of the society. The officers are working in difficult conditions and yet the satisfaction that they derive out of you know bringing about some change making a difference to the lives of some people and also getting the understanding and insights about how people are living what are their needs what needs to be done all this is actually extremely extremely important because these insights that you gather in the field, they become the input for the government policies, programs that you design along with others when you work in the secretariat or in the directorates. We know that the emoluments and the perks that an NCS officer gets may not be comparable with the kind of earnings that people have in other professions. But then, the unique opportunity to serve the people and bring about their upliftment is what makes civil service so special. Civil servants are significant stakeholders in ensuring the progress of the nation and are uniquely positioned to improve the lives of citizens. They are the most visible and effective agents of change in our society. You all know that civil services are given special protection under the Constitution of India, under Article 309. We are all protected. And the kind of protection that has been given is actually an attempt to insulate the civil services from extraneous pressures. Some of the pressures were uh, hinted at by the President of NSA. Maybe the framers of the Constitution those days, they realized that the civil services will require that kind of protection. Otherwise, it is possible that in the hands of some unscrupulous elements, the services may not be able to discharge the responsibilities that we cast upon them. So that's why in terms of, you know, we have a permanent service. It is not a temporary service in the first place. Secondly, there is no hiring and firing system in the, in the service, in the government service I should say but particularly for civil servants con context, there is no hire and fire. Just imagine if a system of hire and fire was there, what would happen? It will be impossible to actually have a 
you know, rule-based society. It would have become a society where you do the work which is expected of you or what is being directed, whether it is as per law, whether it is lawful or not lawful. And if you don't follow, then you are checked out. So that kind of system is not there. Your, you know, service conditions are protected. They cannot be varied to your disadvantage. So these are the protections that are available through the constitution. And as an organized bureaucracy, we enjoy all these privileges. We know that there are some system inefficiencies like uh, what was being referred in the transfer postings. We would very much like that we follow a very objective and rule-based system in transfer postings. And in fact, uh, I'll personally be very happy to look at the suggestions that the association is giving. And I can say that we will try our best to ensure that a proper system of transfer postings is put in place. Many attempts have been made in the past and some rules, regulations are there on paper but somehow the enforcement of these rules and regulations is perhaps not satisfactory and I am sure it leaves a lot of dissatisfaction and a kind of heartburn among many members of the service. Jokingly they say that there are two cadres in the NCS. One cadre is to serve in the remote areas and the other cadre serves in the capital and uh, you know this commercially important place. So people who are in the other cadre, they spend almost their entire life in all these remote districts on our eastern borders and other backward areas whereas many people are spending almost their entire career in the other part. Many of these people were actually very senior retired bureaucrats, chief secretaries of various states and other experts. They came and they interacted with the NCS officers in the ATI. And uh, I also happened to interact with them, some of them. And the feedback I got was really very satisfying, I would say. All these experts were actually very impressed with the kind of officers we have in the NCS, the kind of uh, <coughs> talent that we are recruiting. And they were really impressed by you know, the education, articulation, the ideas and how you present your ideas and the kind of work that you do was really, really impressive. So that is very satisfying because the state government and I would say the whole scheme of things is such that recruitment is very fair, it is merit based. We have managed to maintain the systems through the NPSC because of which the best of the best talent is actually attracted to the NCS and that is how we are able to attract and recruit people who are the best in the, in the state. Nagaland Civil Service also like all other walks of life needs to create a culture of generating fresh ideas, innovation and best practices. It's now a crucial time for us to adapt, innovate and embrace the values that underpin our service. 
that is integrity, transparency and accountability. These are the guiding principles that will ensure the continued progress and prosperity of our state. We also need to bring a lot of reforms to improve the capacity and the requirement of training has to be met because one can understand that when you are there in the field in remote places for very long periods and there is no skill upgradation, then many times it happens that when you come to the secretariat and you are required to deal with a specialized assignment, it becomes difficult sometimes to cope with it. So it is very necessary for all the service members to continuously work to you know, upgrade your skills, develop your capacity and focus on certain areas where you could specialize. Ultimately, whether it is IAS or NCS, we are generalists and with due regard to our friends from other services, there is definitely a threat that the time for general generalists is over and it is time for specialists to take over. So in that kind of situation, what you need to do, what we need to do perhaps is to continue to upgrade ourselves and with focus on one specialization along with the field experience that you have. It is an unbeatable combination. You become extremely good and indispensable because nobody has the kind of experience that an NCS officer has of working with the people. Reflection is extremely important. That is where you actually start thinking and then you can generate ideas and you can actually look at problems dispassionately and that is how you get solutions. So reflect on what we are doing, what we need to do, what is the gap, how that gap can be filled. These are the things which each one of us has to do and that is how self-improvement takes place. From the government side, I can assure you that we are always sensitive to the requirements of the service NCS because it is the premier service of the state. It is the highest service of the state and uh, therefore the state government is fully committed to provide whatever facilities or whatever dispensation is required for the career progression of the officers or the development of the officers of the service because indirectly all this is an investment in ensuring the ultimate development and welfare of the state. So with these very few words, I once again want to thank the association for giving me this chance to come here and share my thoughts. I once again greet all of you on this uh, important occasion and thank you very much. God bless. How do you explain? How do you describe? A love that goes from this to this and rises to pass it is wide.
delivery of services relating to governance is very important. And that is what I've learned starting from the 13th house and continuing to do so. The agendas and the uh, papers, the matters, the issues that come to the assembly, to the public accounts, which our senior officers and our chief secretary is well aware, which comes to the estimates, gives me a glimpse of what is happening, how it is happening, and what we are doing to arrest and rectify certain situations. In all the issues that come up, the underlying factor which I have observed uniformly is the last mile delivery of services relating to governance at the village, at the block, at the district level. We are in a very important transitional stage, our state, all of us. We must work together, starting from an ESE officer, down up, high up to the senior most officer. The experiences that you have gained, regardless of lack of facility, regardless of the challenges, the difficulty, the logistical nightmare, regardless of all that, the experience that you have gained are very pertinent heart inputs based on which policy legislation can take place. And so, the hardships which you may face today, take it as a preparation for you to give back in the form of policy formulation in the years to come. And these hard facts are irrefutable. I would like to take this opportunity to raise a point in which we may all work together, and that is on the point that Nagaland State is having the majority of the populace living in the village areas. I represent a constituency in which 70% of the voters and the population is from the rural area. It may be relevant for today's conference, it may not be relevant. But I still would want to share this point because I will never get this opportunity with all the senior officers and the officers of the Nagaland Civil Service to share this talk. And I want you to go home today with this talk so that you may you may take a support in the view, in favor of the view, or it may give you something to think about. <coughs> we are very proud as Nagas of our identity. We are very proud of who we are. Are we proud of where we are at the moment? Ask yourself that question. Are you proud of where you are at the moment? I think the most important thing to speak on that, on that relevant point, would be to go back to our roots and see our brethren, how they are doing at the village, at the block, at the district level. We are proud of who we are, and that is why with the 73rd and the 74th Amendment, we have the Village Council Act and the Urban Local Bodies. The Village Council Act of 1978 gives a statutory right to the Village Council, meaning it is a quasi-government agency, if I'm not mistaken. I think all of us, we come from different constituencies, from different villages, and we are a stakeholder in that. The changes that we want to see, the changes that we want the world to see about us, I think should start from there. 
governance must be effectively implemented at the village level by the village council. And our sincere Nagaland civil services officers have been doing that so far. But we must make more effort in ensuring that the quasi-statutory party continue. <coughs> to function and to provide the services to the people on behalf of the government as statutorily enacted and passed by all of us. With that, I think we may be getting somewhere to reach somewhere. Unless we do that, unless we do that, 274 odd NCS officers, 60 honorable members, and an equal number of civil servants from the Indian Administrative Service or be it the Indian Police Service, we may not be able to sustain or rather achieve what individually we are all thinking about. I think in that, our collective effort and our collective contribution through participation is very important. I say this as a parent, as a young father. I know you are all, most of you, many of you are parents, fathers and mothers. We have to think about our children. We can only build such a high wall as is permitted by our strength. But we know one day our children is going to go out beyond the wall. Are you secure? Are you satisfied with what you have done? so that without any thoughts in our mind, in our hearts, that we can let go of our children to face the world? I alone cannot do that. You alone cannot do that. But I think together, we can create a better world for them, for the future generations that are coming. And this is a continuous effort that needs continuity over a period of 10, 15, 20 years. It's never too late to start. Senior officers may have started, but I want to encourage each and every one of you present here today that we go home with that thought so that we introspect on what we have achieved. And we introspect on the point of where we are. And to do that, I think collectively, we have to build a better future, a better society for the future generation. And in that, I sincerely want to thank the, the President of the Nagaland Civil Service Association for giving me the opportunity and the privilege to speak a few words on the 46th General Conference of the NCS Officers. And also want to thank all the senior officers for your tireless effort, your sincerity, and for the passion that you have in serving our people. And I urge each and every one of you here as a parent and as a dedicated senior officer that we are here together. The honorable members are also here together with you so that we are able to collectively work towards the upliftment, socioeconomic, 
economic upliftment of our people. Under the able leadership of our most honorable chief minister, I as a young member of the August House, we are going through a very important transition, a stage of the state, of our society. But we are in a transformation mode, I should say. And in that, let us not lose, let us lose sleep. Let, let us lose the things we desire and contribute collectively so that we are proud of where we are in a few years from now. With those few words, I wish the very best to all the Nagaland Civil Service Association officers led by the President. I wish this conference a grand success. And I wish all the other services led by the presidents who are present here the same grand success and best wishes to all of you. Thank you and shalom greetings to all of you. Thank you. As we draw the curtains of this enlightening and enriching for the sixth general conference of the Nagaland Civil Service Association, it is with profound sense of gratitude and appreciation that I extend my heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you. First and foremost, I express my sincere gratitude to our special, special guest, Honorable Speaker, Sri Sharingyan Longomar, whose insightful contributions has illuminated our understanding of the key challenges and opportunities facing the civil service in our state. A big thank you to the NCSA band for the beautiful and heartwarming song this morning. I also would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the IBS Association, NPS Association, Kansia, Fonsesa, Nita, NSS, Nagaland TV's Association, and other dignitaries and officials. Your invaluable presence here with us today has made this conference even grander. 